Hello, I'm Adrian Atkinson. Thanks for joining us as we open another Jamaica magazine. On today's pages, we put the spotlight on the Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority's efforts to modernize the aviation sector, and we meet an outstanding Jamaican scholar. Don't go away. We'll have these and more right after the news. The Jamaica Information Service, JIS, your number one source of government information. Tell your friends and keep watching. Good day, I'm Lorraine Mendez and this is your JIS News for Tuesday, January 31. Government has moved to calm growing fears locally and among some Jamaicans in the diaspora about recent events in the United States. Since taking office, U.S. President Donald Trump has signed several executive orders, including one on immigration from seven Muslim-majority countries, which has raised concerns among Jamaicans. But Foreign Affairs Minister Senator Kamina Johnson-Smith is urging Jamaicans to remain calm and responsible on the issue. Senator Johnson Smith says it's extremely unhelpful for persons to incite panic on matters that are very complex, technical, and subject to a lot of uncertainty. She says the Jamaican government is examining the issues and is making every effort to ascertain the scope of the executive orders. We are in contact with the U.S. Embassy here, and through our missions, we are in contact with the State Department overseas. As soon as we are clear on the advice that we can give to the public on any impact on the Jamaican community, we will do so. Please be assured that we are monitoring these issues closely with your interests at heart. Minister Johnson Smith says a request for documentation on the executive orders has been made to the U.S. Embassy in Jamaica and missions in the United States. She says this will ensure that Jamaicans receive accurate information to guide their actions. In other news, government will be focusing on economic growth and job creation when it drafts the national budget for the 2017-2018 financial year. That is among the outcomes of a two-day cabinet retreat held at Jamaica House last week, Thursday and Friday. Led by Prime Minister Andrew Holness, the cabinet members engaged in intensive planning and review of the programs for the upcoming financial year. A statement from the Office of the Prime Minister reveals that a number of strategic priorities were identified. The ministers and technical experts from the Ministry of Finance and other agencies reportedly examined each program proposal to ensure that they would be meaningfully beneficial and equitable to the poor and vulnerable in the society. The cabinet also examined government's performance in the current financial year and discussed how to build on the gains. The 2017-2018 estimates of expenditure will be tabled in Parliament on Thursday, February 9. The budget debate will follow from March 9 to 22. Effective July 1, all sugar, including granulated sugar, will be mandated to be packaged and labeled in accordance with the Bureau of Standards requirements. Agriculture Minister Carl Samuda says the compulsory standard and labeling system is among several measures to expand production and productivity in the sugarcane industry. The measures also support increasing exports to the region and greater investment. We want to give the manufacturing sector and those workers in the field who produce cane that is processed into sugar and those creative manufacturers who have designed their own packages for export, we want to give them an even chance to succeed. Because if we succeed in this venture, the net returns to Jamaica in terms of foreign exchange earnings and creation of jobs is enormous. Minister Samuda was speaking at last week's staging of the 12th Regional Jamaica Stock Exchange Investments and Capital Markets Conference. Under the new labeling system, sugar sold on the local market will be packaged to guarantee the integrity of the product and to protect it from contamination. The standard will also serve as a disincentive for manufacturers that import sugar for use as raw material to divert it to the local retail trade. And still on sugar, the industry is expected to contribute 10 billion Jamaican dollars in earnings to the economy this year. That is no ordinary industry. It also contributes to the employment of some 50,000 people. Most importantly is that it's one of the most resilient crops you have. The agriculture minister was positive in his outlook for the sector, projecting earnings of 700 US dollars per ton, up from 370 US dollars per ton last year. 
And finally, the Environmental Foundation of Jamaica EFJ is providing $84.92 million in grant funding to implement climate change adaptation and resilience building projects across the island. The grant agreements, which were signed on Monday, are the first signed under the Special Climate Change Adaptation Fund. The funds are being provided to 18 civil society organizations. The EFJ is back in business in grant making business. We've been off the scene for a while and we're back in business so you can start to prepare your proposals for the next call. The fund is supported by the Adaptation Program and Finance Mechanism Project of the Pilot Program for Climate Resilience. That program is being implemented by the Ministry of Economic Growth and Job Creation and is financed by the Inter-American Development Bank. At the national level, the project will be supporting the mainstreaming of climate change adaptation into national and sectoral planning processes. This will, among other things, ensure that policy and planning processes create an enabling environment for community-level adaptation. Grants of up to $5 million are provided for community-level climate change adaptation initiatives such as soil conservation, reforestation, waste management, disaster preparedness, and climate-smart construction. And that's it for JIS News Today. I'm Lorraine Mendez. Thank you for watching. Productivity, pathway to prosperity. A message brought to you by the Jamaica Productivity Center, a department of the Ministry of Labor and Social Security. Kingston remains the country's commercial mecca, and with the grand plans for the city's redevelopment, surely will come expanded business and traffic flowing in and out of a busier commercial district. So, upgrading work is underway on one of the main road corridors connecting downtown Kingston with westerly areas to ease traffic congestion for motorists. The project is about improving the flow of traffic from east to west along Marcus Garvey Drive. Some years ago when the Portmore Toll was constructed, a section of Marcus Garvey Drive was widened. Uh, this project is about improving from 4th Avenue where they, that project had ended up to Pechon Street, uh, which is roughly 2.4 kilometers. A National Works Agency survey reveals that about 40,000 vehicles travel along this roadway in both directions daily. The latest improvement work, which started in March 2016, will see the targeted section of the road being upgraded from its current four lanes to six. The drainage infrastructure is also being enhanced. This should significantly mitigate the likelihood of flooding caused by weather conditions. Undulations or sinking of road surface areas due to base failure is also expected to be a thing of the past. We have improved the drainage significantly. We have constructed, we have, we have widened the Tivoli Gully as well as the Shoemaker Gully. We have put in a number of new culverts. We have lifted the road in some sections by as much as three feet. We have put down a stabilized cement base which is a, a, a concrete base. Asphaltic concrete paving is being laid on top of the stabilized concrete base, making the road more durable. Realignment of a section of Marcus Garvey Drive should also see commuters having easier transition onto Harbor Street. We are straightening that kink that's out at Water Lane, between Water Lane and Pitchon Street, so that, you know, persons can make a smooth transition from Marcus Garvey Drive onto Waterlane, onto Petron Street, 
and go about their business. The design of the road is expected to give it a lifespan of up to 50 years, during which time no major fixing would be required. It is a highway standard, which is, which is the, 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 the highest um, degree that, 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 that we can go. And so it is on that basis, you know, we are, we are saying that the corridor will perform uh, much better than it had been for many, many years. Lanes going in opposite directions are being separated by a concrete median barrier. Necessary signage and road markings are also being installed. To keep pedestrians safe, sidewalks are being built on both sides of the road. We are also going to be installing um, traffic signals at six intersections with pedestrian facilities so pedestrians should have an easier time or easier access to get across this very busy corridor. We hope that persons will use the facilities that they are going to be provided with. As part of the safety measures, the speed limit on Marcus Garvey Drive will remain at 50 kilometers per hour, which is in line with safety standards for roads in built-up areas. The construction is being done under the major infrastructure development program and is set to be completed by April 2017. The contractor is China Harbor Engineering Company, and the 20.5 million US dollar project is being financed through a concessionary loan from the Chinese government. The National Works Agency has oversight of the construction, which has provided work for more than 100 persons. We have to ensure that the pavement fitness as planned is constructed. We have to ensure that the quality of the material that is planned is placed and the, the quality of the workmanship. Development of roads do drive social and economic development, and this road promises much with its improved capacity, linking the island's main commercial district, the Kingston Freeport Terminal, and the Norman Manley International Airport. The improvement should reduce traffic on the road, cut travel time, and offer other benefits that improve quality of life for persons who must use it. Informing, educating, entertaining. That's what we do. Keep watching Jamaica Magazine. On our roads, remember, take time, be courteous, drive good, walk good. Part of keeping our roads safe is ensuring the vehicles we drive are mechanically safe, meeting all roadworthy requirements. And besides that, we must be good drivers and avoid risk-taking and sensation-seeking behaviors which are prone to causing road crashes. The Norman Manley International Airport has undergone some major changes in recent times. It's all part of the Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority's continued mission to ensure the island maintains its reputation as the leader in the region's aviation industry. Let's find out more. Today, we see the beginning of a new phase. Something that started back in 2010 is finally ready, and it is a pleasure to be your guide through the formal proceedings this afternoon. I am Paula Ann Porter-Jones. Welcome. On November 16, 2016, specially invited guests from varying sectors gathered at the Norman Manley International Airport for the official opening of the Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority's JCAA's new air traffic control tower. The new state-of-the-art control tower is 131 feet high and spans 8,000 square feet of space. Construction began in 2012 under a contractual agreement with the Canadian company Intelcan. It replaces the old tower which was built over 40 years ago. The transfer of operations to the new tower has now been accomplished with the confidence that the facility now conforms to and performs in accordance with the international standards of reliability, safety and operational performance which are required for air navigation systems the world over. 
The 20 million Canadian dollar facility places Jamaica in a position to continue maintaining its reputation as a leader in the international aviation industry. Our recent result from the International Civil Aviation Authority's validation mission in June 2016 further confirms Jamaica's status as a leader in civil aviation administration. An ICAO audit in 2007 indicated Jamaica's effective implementation of ICAO's standards and recommended practices at 54%. A follow-up mission in 2012 indicated an effective implementation status of 67%. And the most recent mission in June of this year indicated an effective implementation of international standards at 82.38%, the highest for all countries in the English-speaking Caribbean. JCAA Chairman Philip Henriquez in his remarks, read by Deputy Chairman Robert Evans, congratulated aviation staff for ensuring this record achievement. Nowhere is complexity greater than in the systems which control aircraft, airports, and air traffic management. Accordingly, the highest levels of specialization, training, and professional excellence are required to operate these complex systems safely and efficiently. And so, while today is a day to celebrate the accomplishment of a technological feat, it is also a day to recognize the contribution of a range of professionals, including air traffic controllers, air traffic service personnel, regulators, and the support staff whose consistent performance allows the JCAA to meet the challenges of ensuring responsible regulation as well as safe and efficient air navigation services to the aviation community. Transport and Mining Minister Mike Henry, in his message read by JCAA Chairman Philip Henriquez, said the modernization of the air navigation services signals to local and international interests, as well as air traffic controllers, that the government is committed to providing service in a modern building with equipment of the highest standard. We believe that the new facility will make Jamaica's delivery of air navigation services more reliable and efficient. It will boost the island's thrust to establish our aviation hub as a conduit to the world and it will enable our cadre of skilled and highly trained air traffic controllers to continue providing the safest and most efficient air traffic management services available to the local and international aviation communities. And this is just part of a comprehensive modernization program. It should also be noted that the government through the JCAA is upgrading and enhancing the island's communications, navigation and surveillance systems. These projects, which are set for completion in October 2017, include the manufacturing of and installation of a new state-of-the-art air traffic management system, new L-band primary and mode S radar technology, as well as the installation of a voice communication and control system. I'm also proud to announce that a new tower is to be opened at the Sangster International Airport. We look forward to the many benefits to come as a result of what we have shared in here this afternoon. The Jamaica Civil Aviation Authority, committed to the safe and orderly development of aviation in Jamaica. Nutritious food, succulent dishes, superior workmanship, and excellent service. Jamaica is on the go. Let's grow what we eat and eat what we grow. Let's harness the indomitable spirit of our most valued resource, our people. Let's support our local businesses. After all, buying Jamaican means building Jamaica. What does it take to be a scholar? Find out more as we have a chat with this year's recipient of the Rhodes Scholarship. This is Shakiba Foster, the 2017 recipient of one of the most prestigious scholarships in the world, the Rhodes Scholarship. 
It's an awesome feeling, overwhelming at times. After hours of grueling interviews, Shakiba came out on top of a field of 10 outstanding candidates to be awarded the scholarship. Really outstanding young people, any one of whom could have been the Rhodes Scholar, and we finally chose Shakiba Foster. The fact that she is clearly very intelligent and very thoughtful. She had uh, many thoughts about education in Jamaica, about its economic problems, the AMF program, the way forward. The Rhodes Scholarship is tenable at the Oxford University in the United Kingdom, the oldest English-speaking university in the world, and ranked second in the 2015-2016 World University Rankings. This year, Shakiba will join 94 other students from around the world who have been awarded the scholarship to pursue studies at Oxford. I'm grateful for the opportunity to be um, going off to Oxford, having that awesome opportunity to be doing uh, more economics and MPhil in economics at Oxford. For every year since 1904, except during the Second World War, an outstanding Jamaican has been selected to be Rhodes Scholar. Shakiba is the second graduate of St. Diego High School to join the ranks, and she remains thankful to all those who helped her excel. My family has been a great help. I remember studying at nights and my aunts tired but staying up with me to ensure that we got to bed together. Uh, my mother, my aunts, my friends, um, teachers have definitely been a, a great help, and so I have to say thanks to them. To be named Rhodes Scholar, Shakiba, like her predecessors, had to display outstanding intellect, character, leadership and commitment to service. Other persons, when they hear Rhodes Scholars, they think, wow, bright person. But I have to tell you the truth, at San Diego, I really didn't dominate in terms of academics. I, I had a few persons who really outdid me, did far better than I did. Um, I pushed and I did well enough when I got to UA. Um, was difficult in terms of a new environment, uh, but, but, but I got through. As anybody else, I've had difficulties in terms of financing, in terms of family issues and so on, but I've always tried not to focus too much on the issues and just do what I need to do. Hard work and, and time management. At the end of it all, Shakiba's disciplined approach paid off. I finished my banking and finance program with the highest GPA. Um, I actually finished my degree at highest GP in the entire Faculty of Social Sciences. On completion of her BSc degree in Banking and Finance, Shakiba went on to do a Master of Science degree at the University of the West Indies, which she completed with distinction. The 2017 Rhodes Scholar is now an Assistant Lecturer in the Faculty of Social Sciences, a position she enjoys immensely. Despite her hectic university schedule, Shakiba has always found time to take on leadership responsibilities in her Riversdale community in St. Catherine. Once you start doing things from early, you realize that at the end of the day, you have a, um, you have a lot of time for other stuff. Um, church activities take up most of my other time. And what are her future plans? I'm going off to do an MPhil in economics. If I do well enough at, at that MPhil, I, I hope to go on to a DPhil in economics, which is um, a PhD in economics, really. Um, after that, I, I want to do some more teaching. I, I want hope to do a little bit more lecturing. Um, and I'm just seeing where the tides take me after that. I, I don't have a definite plan, and I, I feel it's all right not to have a definite plan. Um, it's all right to let your experiences lead you into new opportunities. For youngsters aspiring to excel academically, the 2017 Rhodes Scholar has these words of advice. You're not always going to be ahead, but that does not always mean, you know, you're, you're not going to achieve anything. Um, some people will have it difficult, some people will have it easy, and sometimes we tend to want to have it easy like everybody else. But I've learned that difficult times normally make better persons. And so go through difficult times, and just work hard, and I'm sure you'll achieve much. If you're an aspiring Rhodes Scholar, application for the scholarship is usually open between early July and early October every year. Application forms can be downloaded from the Rhodes Trust website at www.rhodes-caribbean.com.
we have a subculture that supports those who do not inform an anti-informer culture that pervades our entire society that we must break down I don't think people should smoke in public because it affects others, you understand? And some people have asthma and, uh, you know, all different kind of sickness and things like that. So, no, I don't think it's right at all. I don't think it's good for a new man consumption and uh, I use cigarette scent. I do not smoke. I've never, and I will never start. And I don't think it's healthy because I have a lot of nicotine and that nicotine is not healthy for the human body. The reason why I'm an anti-smoker is the illness associated with smoking, right? They are what you call lung cancer, right? And um, people can develop tuberculosis because of cigarette smoking. I'm a very bad smoker. I smoke a lot, and I know it's not good. So I don't even know what to say. More I stop and don't even know what to stop. Bad habit. Not good. I think cigarette smoking is very dangerous. Um, as in second and smoking, it can cause others around them to be affected by it. Even the person smoking it, it can cause them to have heart problems, hypertension, and even cancer. It's very dangerous. It's really bad to the health still. We know that. You know, about some young people they doing it. I don't know if it's for the fun or their lifestyle, I don't know. But it's really bad for me still. Smoking is dangerous to one health. It can cause a lot of diseases like tuberculosis, you can have lung cancer. Cigarette smoking is not good for anyone's health. Even people who don't smoke, you have second hand, it can affect them. So I may be in an area, I don't smoke, but someone who is smoking it can affect me. It causes disease of the lungs, it leads to cancer. Cigarette smoking is very dangerous. And I think um, people should try to stop. They may not quit at once, but slowly they can try and quit smoking. Violence against women and girls is a human problem. Not just a woman's problem, it's a problem for men too. Gender violence takes many forms, including sexual assault, domestic violence, relationship abuse, sexual harassment, and sexual abuse of children. The magnitude of ongoing violence against women and children in our country is cause for alarm. We can end the violence it requires all of us to end the violence. I call on all our men and women in Jamaica to take a stand. And men especially must get involved in this movement to create a better world for their daughters, their mothers, their sisters, their aunts, their uncles, their fathers, their sons, and for themselves. Let's protect and reassure. Let's unite to end gender violence. We have come to the end of today's edition of Jamaica Magazine. You may keep informed about happenings in Jamaica by visiting our website, jis.gov.jm, and do stay connected with us on our various social media platforms. On behalf of all of us here at the JIS, I'm Adrian Atkinson. See you next time. This has been a production of the Jamaica Information Service, the voice of Jamaica.